Today is the eve of the Feast of the Nativity, and many of you will be attending Mass tonight, starting with some Christmas carols at 11.30 or thereabouts, and then the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass will begin at the stroke of midnight on the Feast of the Nativity. So I hope this is a blessed day for you. And I'm presenting this today instead of some news story, because I'd really like to not have news stories on feast days or days that have any sort of connotation of a feast day to them. It's not always something I can do, but I try not to do such a thing. Now, let's pray together <laughs> that the uh, that Francis the Merciful will not inflict on the church some sort of bad news on this day that requires me to put up a second video today. Let's all hope that that happens, <laughs> or does not happen, rather, that today is just another peaceful day. So, with that, to that end in mind, I have for you something from St. Bonaventure. It is his reflection on the birth of our blessed Lord. So listen carefully, and I hope you find this edifying. On the Birth of Jesus Christ by St. Bonaventure The term of nine months being then ended, a decree went forth from the emperor that all the world should be taxed, each in his own city. Then Joseph, proposing to go into his own city, Bethlehem, and knowing that the time of his wife's delivery was at hand, took her with him. Here again the virgin undertakes a long journey, for Bethlehem is but five or six miles distant from Jerusalem. They took with them, tradition says, an ox and an ass, and traveled as poor cattle dealers. And when they reached Bethlehem, because they were poor, and the place was crowded by those who had come for the same purpose, there was no, no room for them in the inn. Here compassionate the virgin and regard for her, young and delicate, as one of the age of fifteen would be, fatigued with the long journey, abashed in the midst of the crowd, and in vain seeking a shelter. It being everywhere roughly rejected, she and her husband obliged to take refuge in a sort of wayward side shed, the mere shelter of persons who were overtaken by the rain. There we may suppose that Joseph, who was by trade a carpenter, might perhaps have constructed a kind of enclosure. But now most carefully attend to all that I am about to relate, for these things are reported to have been revealed by the Virgin herself to a certain holy man, and one, I think, worthy of credit of our order, who told them to me. When the hour of her delivery had arrived on Sunday at midnight, the Virgin, rising from her seat, rested herself against a pillar which was there. Joseph sat, perhaps grieving that it was not in his power to provide what was fitting for such a time. Then he arose and took some hay out of the manger and laid it at the feet of the virgin, and thereupon withdrew himself to another part. Then the son of the eternal God was born, without pain or hurt to his mother, having passed from her in an instant to the bed of hay, prepared for him at her feet. His mother quickly stooped down and took him into, his arm, into her arms, and, sweetly embracing him, laid him on her lap. Then through the suggestion of the Holy Spirit she began to wash and bathe him, and her breasts were distended through the blessing of heaven. After this she perhaps wrapped him in her veil and placed him in the manger. And now the ox and ass, with bended knee, and with their heads placed over the manger, breathed upon him as if they were gifted with reason, and knew that their warm breath would be of service to an infant so slightly protected from the severity of the season. But his mother, kneeling down, adored and gave thanks to God, saying, I thank thee, Lord, Holy Father, for that thou hast given to me thy Son, and I adore thee, eternal God, and thee, the Son of the living God, and mine. And Joseph likewise adored him, and taking the ass's saddle, he drew, we may imagine, away from it the pillion of wood or leather, and placed it by the manger, that the virgin might sit upon it. But she, seating herself there, used it for a support, and so remained that mother, who is blessed above all, gazing on the manger, having, as it were, no thought of or love for any but her dearest son. Thus we have been following the account of this revelation. After the Blessed Virgin departed, an angel is said to have lingered behind, in order to speak words in her praise, what I could neither understand nor repeat. You have seen then the birth of the highest, and have also contemplated the delivery of the Blessed Mother, and you must have observed how conspicuous in both was their extreme poverty, how even necessaries were wanting to them. This exalted virtue the Lord first brought into prominence. This is that pearl in the gospel to purchase which all was sold. This is the first foundation of the whole spiritual house, for with a load of temporal goods the spirit cannot ascend up to God. Of this St. Francis said, Learn, brethren, that poverty is the spiritual way of salvation, the nourishment of lowliness, and the root of perfection, the fruit of which manifold yet hidden, 
Therefore, it is a great shame to us that we do not embrace it with all our strength, but instead thereof we burden ourselves with unnecessary things, when the Lord of the whole world and his mother most strictly and most studiously observe it. Concerning which St. Bernard thus says, On earth this virtue sounds, and man knows not the price thereof. This is the Son of God, desiring come down from heaven to choose for himself and to teach us how precious it is in his estimation. Adorn thy heart as a chamber for the spouse with lowliness and poverty. In these swaddling clothes he delights, as his mother testifies. In these he wills to wrap us as though worth silks. Sacrifice the abominations of the Egyptians to thy God. Thus far, St. Bernard. The same writer in a sermon on the Nativity thus begins, Blessed be our God and Father. At length he consoles his people. Would you know who his people are? The man after God's own heart tells us, The poor committed himself to thee. And Christ in the Gospel says, Woe unto you that are rich, for ye have your consolation. But what can yet console those who already have their consolation? The infancy of Christ affords no consolation to the talkative. The tears of Christ are no comfort to gigglers. The swaddling coat clothes are no consolation to the gaudy. The stable and manger are no comfort to those who love first seats in the temple. To the poor shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks, the joyful light was first announced. And unto them the Savior was born. To the poor, to laboring men, and not to you rich who have already your consolation and your possessions. Thus far St. Bernard. Moreover, in this mystery of the Nativity, we can contemplate the profound humility of the Son of God and of his mother. They did not disdain a stable for their dwelling, nor the cattle, hay, and other mean things which were around them. This virtue in all its acts, both our Lord and his mother most perfectly observed, and thereby commended it to us. Let us strive then to do all in our power to embrace it, for without it there is no salvation, because whatever we do when it is mixed with pride cannot please God. According to St. Augustine, pride turned angels into devils. Humility turns men into angels. And St. Bernard says, What kind of man ought he, think you, to be who has chosen to fill the place of a lost angel? Pride once disturbed that kingdom, shook its walls, partly threw them down, and no small part of them too. What then follows? Would not that pest be abominated by the inhabitants most of all? Be assured, brethren, that he who spared not the proud angels will not spare men. God will not be inconsistent with himself. Then you can consider in the Son of God and his mother, but mostly in the infinite Jesus, the heart-rending sufferings of this mystery. Of this, St. Bernard speaks thus. The Son of God at his birth, when he had the power to choose whatever time he liked, chose that which was most painful, especially to a tender infant, the son of a poor mother who had scarcely any clothes to cover him, and nothing but a manger in which to cradle him, and notwithstanding there was such urgent need for him, we hear nothing of warm furs in which to wrap him. And again, Christ, who cannot make a mistake, chose what was most painful to the flesh. This, therefore, is best, and most profitable, and to be preferred, and whoever teaches or advises the contrary is to be avoided as a seducer. And again, he, brethren, was foretold a long time before by the prophet Isaiah as the child, who should know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Therefore, what is pleasant to the flesh is evil, what is painful is good, since that wise child, the infant word, chose the latter and rejected the former. Thus St. Bernard speaks, Go and do that likewise, but act discreetly, and not exceed your power. We shall have more to say about these virtues in another place. Let us return to the scene in the Nativity. The Lord then being born, a multitude of angels came to worship him, and having adored their God, forthwith went to the shepherds, who were about a mile from Bethlehem, to announce to them the birth of Christ and where it took place. Thence they went up to heaven with songs and joyous strains, announcing to their fellow citizens the same event. Then the whole heavenly court, in raptures of joy, celebrated the mystery with pomp and praise, making acts of thanksgiving to the Eternal Father. And all who were there, according to their different orders, descend successively to see the face of the Lord their God, and adoring him with all reverence and beholding his mother. They filled the air with songs of praise. For who of them, having heard these tidings, could have remained in heaven, and not visited his Lord in his so lowly estate upon earth? This proud feeling could not have possessed one of them, and therefore the apostle says, Again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Whatever be the truth in this matter, it is sweet to me to meditate thus on the angels. The shepherds came and worshipped him, bringing tidings of what they had heard from the angels. His most prudent mother, mother was all the while keeping in her heart whatever she heard concerning her child, and the shepherds departed, rejoicing on their way.
Bend thy knee, too, you who have lingered before this scene. Worship thy Lord God, and reverence his mother, and the holy and venerable Joseph. Then kiss in the spirit the feet of the child Jesus, as he lies on his bed of hay, and ask in spirit his mother to hold him forth, that you may receive him into your arms, and take him, embrace him, attentively regard his features, kiss him reverently, and delight him in trust, trustfully. Thus you may do, because he came into the world to save sinners." and after humbly conversing with them, left himself to them for their food. Therefore his benignity will patiently suffer himself to be handled, as you desire, and he will not ascribe it to presumption, but to love. Yet these acts must always be accompanied with reverence and fear, because he is the holy of holies. Then imagine that you restore him to his mother, and carefully observe with what care and wisdom she takes charge of him, gives him suck, and performs other parental duties. Be ready to your services as if you could, meditate on them, delight and rejoice in them, and with continual devotion take the posture of one who would gladly, with the Blessed Mother, minister to the child Jesus and often gaze upon that face which angels desire to look upon. But always as I repeat with reverence and fear that you may not suffer a repulse, for you ought to regard yourself as unworthy to converse with him. You ought also to contemplate with joy how great is this day's solemnity, for today Christ was born, and therefore it is truly the birthday of the eternal King and of the Son of the living God. This day unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This day the Son of Righteousness, which was before under a cloud, shone forth brightly. This day the Holy Spirit, head of the church of the elect people, came forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber. This day who is fairer than the sons of men showed his face so long desired. This day first was made, that angelic hymn, Glory to God in the highest. This day peace was announced to men according to the same hymn. This day, as the church throughout the whole world sings, heavens distilled honey in the church the angels sang on earth. This day the kindness and goodness of God our Savior first appeared. This day God is adored in the likeness of sinful flesh. This day these two miracles happened, which surpass all understanding, and which can be apprehended only by the faith. Namely, God is born and a virgin brings forth. This day a multitude of other miracles took place. In short, all that has been written about the Incarnation shone brightly forth, and whatever was beforehand commenced was only now manifested, and therefore it is permissible to add to these meditations. Passages which do not coincide in, time of in point of time, and yet bear upon the subject. It is evident, then, that this day is one of public rejoicing and gladness, and of great delight. It is a matter of faith, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, that Our Lady gave birth to Our Lord painlessly, that he passed as a light through a window, as I believe St. Thomas Aquinas described it. That is de fide. And thus is why I reject categorically all the, uh, depictions of, our, of the nativity of Our Lord that shows Our Lord being birthed with pains, as in a every other human being's <laughs> means of being born into the world. I reject them categorically because they are contrary to the faith and, and are an attack upon Our Lady. So, bear that in mind. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. And remember, today is the Feast of the Nativity, or it will very well shortly. This is the eve of the Feast of the Nativity. So Merry Christmas, and let's finish Advent well, because Advent, and especially Christmas Eve, so it is a day of fasting and abstinence, at least traditionally. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.